to be able to present this work that, I, that's kind of been bubbling in my head for a while, um, particularly around around Karl Popper, and together with my co-collaborator and co-author Nick Rowlands here in the room. Um, yeah, so uh, the original title for this, when we saw the call for the for the conference this year, was "The Limits to Degrowth: Exploring a Critical Rationalist Perspective." Note: It's rationalist, not realist. Okay. Um, and then Responsible Futures Practice and Karl Popper is kind of more of the closer working title for this one. Now, if you want me to go back to talk about a lot of the degrowth stuff, I'm happy to do that, but that'll kind of get kind of relegated a little bit for a while, because um, I think there's some more interesting stuff I'd like to cover with you guys and get your, get your feedback on. So um, we're going to go uh, that way instead. We'll have two parts. We'll do Popper's knowledge creation. So we're gonna rewind the clock 100 years to revisit some of Carl Raymond Popper's original ideas on conjectures and reputations, okay? So this is a, we're gonna, we're gonna do some time travel. We're gonna explore those in the current understanding of the way that we do foresight today, in the way at least some parts, of the, some, some of us think about, about foresight. And then we're gonna kind of dovetail that into responsible futures practice. So what is the, what, if we take what Popper is talking about uh, seriously, what does it mean for responsible futures practice and what does it mean for the field in general, right? So first a little bit about uh, Sir, Sir Karl Popper wrote uh, a big uh, long list of, of books and papers and conference reports that have been transcribed of his. Um, I'm slowly but surely making my way through this list um, he's an amazing author. If you haven't ever read any of his stuff, it's, it, it's really easily uh, graspable for, say, people who are not particularly trained in philosophy or language of philosophy. Um, but his major works have been The Logic of Scientific Discovery, for example, first published in 1934 in German, didn't come out, however, in Engl into English until 1959. Okay, so there's a big gap there. He comes out uh, with poverty of historicism after that. He says, forget about trying to project the future based on any historical past trends. He says that's a, that's a lost cause, and he says that in that book there. Um, he's got then the open society and its, and its, and its enemies, and he start, start, starts to take his philosophy of knowledge creation and apply it to societies and to political systems. And that's uh, probably one of his most well-known books then coming out of uh, here in 1945, in the mid-20th century. And interesting to note here, he was right, born in Vienna, raised Jewish, right, moved to London, and then did the post in New Zealand. But by the time, uh, and then goes back and he spends most of his career in the London School of Economics. As a young uh, man, he was a, a Marxist, and a lot of the challenges and a lot of the ideas that he developed came out of this dissatisfaction with Marxism as a, a, and its predictive ability, right? Um, so that's kind of a frustration that bothers Popper um, uh, throughout his lifetime. And he works then to try to figure out how is it that knowledge grows? How do humans create knowledge, right? Writes uh, Conjectures and Reputations comes out in 1963. will be a bit of a cornerstone of what this talk will, will do. Right, and um, I'm currently reading this one. It's it's super fun, the myth of the framework, where he's really battling against like Teodoro Adorno and um, uh, yeah, and some of the others from from the Frankfurt School of Philosophy. So that's a little bit about uh, uh, Karl Popper. I believe he died in '92, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, some of the core concepts that Popper uses in his theory of knowledge creation, just going to cover these because this is some of the words I'll be using throughout this talk, right? He, he'll have this problem orientation. He says all knowledge grows and it can only grow if you start with a problem first. Okay, we saw a little bit of this in Mariana's talk yesterday, right? That if you have a problem orientation, that is a necessary requirement to grow knowledge. There's no knowledge that just grows on its own, right? But we have a problem and that's really the driving factor because that's something that we have to solve, right? Um, you know, talk a lot about uh, trial and error epistemology. So how do, is it that we do this, right? We try things out and they don't work and we guess and they don't work, right? And we keep refining the way that we understand the world, right? And that's, in other words, we're doing conjecture and re reputation. He comes up with a major uh, components of this in conjectures and reputations called falsification, and this is kind of what he really becomes known for, right? The falsification of no hypotheses, right? In the natural sciences, right? The idea that you can never prove a theory to be true, you can only refute 
right, the theories, right? So, we're, and what is it that we're left with? We can never prove, right, that it's true. And this position is called fallibilism, right? That there is a reality out there outside of our heads. We understand and interpret information, but we can never actually, we can never actually know that reality. Right? But we can get closer and closer and better and explain it better and better. Um, and how do we do this? It comes, this kind of is at the core of what he calls critical rationalism, right? It's this idea that you may be right and I may be wrong. And if we sit together and discuss, we may both become more closer to a truth that's out there. That's his idea of critical rationalism in a nutshell. And then again, open societies that can also uh, work uh, in policy experimentation. And that becomes a large part of his kind of ideas in the open societies is we should probably do small experiments that are more controlled to see if this stuff actually works, right? So he's drawing upon them the falsification ideas. And if we do do that, it's not enough just to do it, but it's about start, before you start, you identify what it is that would make this a valuable study, how would we know that we can falsify this, exper this, this experiment and get rid of the bad theories, right? So that when it comes time to make the decision or do the analysis of how did that policy work, that we're actually pre-prepared to do it and say it's gonna look like this and, and then you can kind of control it. It's very hard, I believe, to do in practice and he would probably agree with that considering the state of the world today. Okay, so that's kind of some of the framework that Popper is gonna bring to the table for us and we're gonna bump into this in a little bit here. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of bring in an example right now to try to help us think through what does it mean to do conjecture and refutation? What does this process look like? You know, and these problems aren't necessarily always the problems of physicists for proper, they're everyday problems. They're literally problems of how am I gonna get here on time? They're literally the problems, you know, uh, troubleshooting the technology to get the right microphone. It's, it's not just that, you know, like planetaries are planets are revolving around suns and stuff. Although he does use the Newton Einstein uh, kind of move quite a bit. So Gulun, Gulun, right? This is a Norse word for the golden lightning, right? This is the name of my rabbit that I have in Denmark, right? So um, my name's I'm from Denmark, by the way. I don't know if I said that, but Gulun. Uh, it's about three years old now lives on the porch outside of my house, right? So outside of the apartment, we got a little porch and Gulu lives out there, he's got a little house, okay? Uh, very cute, but very antisocial, okay? But anyway, it's my rabbit, my family's rabbit, and he's named uh, Golden Lightning because my son thinks he had a lightning bolt coming down the side of his face, okay? So last winter, right, back in January, there were some tracks in the snow outside of the house. So outside of where he lives, I see these little tracks in the snow. I got a problem, right? Oh my God, right? And my kids are with me and we see these tracks together. So, uh oh, what's this? What is it that's stomping around outside of my rabbit's house, right? And we look at the tracks, we don't know, we don't know what these are, right? And we see, you know, my son says, you know, maybe it's that neighbor's dog. You get the neighbor got that new little puppy. I'm like, oh yeah, maybe it's that puppy. And I said, well, what if it's a cat? Because we've seen cats like try to go after the rabbit before when we take it for these like little feeding tours, right? And so we're going, well, and, and my son goes, well, what if it's a bear? I said, well, I don't think it's a bear, but I don't know, but maybe that's right. So we start to put out these ideas on the table, right? And uh, and I, I think we come up with ferrets and badgers and all sorts of other stuff, yeah? Okay. Then, uh, so we took a picture of it. This is actually a replication because I obviously stole this off the internet um, <laughs> because my son took the picture on his phone. Um, but this is what we were looking at, right? So, okay, we got the pattern down. What do we do? And I go to the internet and I realize that these are the tracks of a fox. And I'm from North America. There are foxes, but like you don't see foxes very often. So my frame of world thinking never had me think that we were going to be dealing with a fox and that this fox, he wouldn't be straddle trotting, but he would be walking around the outside because that's what the pattern seems to be. Yeah? Okay, so now we've identified the species that's going after my rabbit, right? And we would only know this because there was a change in the environment, that there was snow on the ground that actually left some evidence behind that this was happening. So um, something had changed in my environment, which led me to uh, identify this, this situation, right? That's part of the 
part of the part of the recipe. So let's talk about Popper's theory of knowledge creation, right? So Popper is going to say that inside of our heads, right, and in our lives and body, whatever, it doesn't matter. There is a a priori infallible stock of tentative ideas, conjectures, preformed anticipations, right, anticipatory <coughs> models, proto hypotheses, and explanations that we live out. So we carry these around with us. Right? We recognize patterns, so we have the ability to recognize patterns, right? And we have uh, reference experiences, cases from the past that we can use and bring to bear on, the, on, on whatever's coming in front of us, okay? So that's where we're starting from. We have this, thing, we encounter the problem revealed by new information or conflict of ideas. That's the necessary state of a problem for Popper. And we have then this desire to want to explain it. Like, I want to know what those tracks are, <laughs> right? I want to know. I want to know. Okay, so, and depending on the problem, we're curious, motivated, optimistic, opportunity seeking, and prepared, right, to a better or less degree. And we're mostly free to pursue this knowledge creation. Okay, so, but there are some problems, ideas that we do not subject to criticism, right? We're, there's dogmas, there's ideologies, there's taboos, there's prejudices out there that we cannot question. So we're mostly free, but not all the time. Right, so they think so we want to explain it, right? And so we start making guesses about possible explanations. So you see the tracks, is it the dog, is it the cat, right? What the hell is it? Right? And so we just invent this conjecture, right? And then we immediately criticize and reject the bad explanations, like it's not a bear, right? Uh, based on past experiences and knowledge. It would be a really small bear, I don't know. We search for information that then help, can help us assess or refute these explanations, right? And this is where we go to the internet, with, right, and we start searching, right? And I'm looking for our, you know, pet tracks in the snow from animals, right? Um, sometimes, though, we may want to confirm, right, uh, our, our explanations that we're coming up with, right? So sometimes, you know, the first thing I said, it was gonna be the neighbor's dog, I'm sticking to that one, so I'm going with for the dog prints because I want to confirm myself. I don't. So, so but Popper's is careful here because that's not what we're doing. We're trying to falsify. We're trying to get rid of the bad explanations just so we can keep the last possible remaining explanation. Now, I want to talk about this right here. I think this is quite interesting for for this audience. Um, so that we have this problem in the world, we want to explain it. We've got new information, conflict of ideas. And we start guessing about these possible explanations, right? So I, this popper says, doesn't matter how you get there. And I think it's, I, I think we can push back a little bit on it doesn't matter, right? You'll see this come out in Verben's book, Against Method or After Method, I believe it actually was called, where he says, yeah, there's no method in science in the build and the growth of science. But uh, okay, we'll we'll see about that. Let's see. So we're here, right? This is the last slide, right? Building conjectures. Right, we want to explain it, and we guess about these possible explanations that we're inventing conjecture. Conjecture. Now there is this. Um, what is it that we want to happen? So sometimes we want to explain it in a way that, hey, look, um, we want to be able to explain this in the way that we want to uh, know it, right? In in the sense that we want to be able to believe ourselves. Right? And believe the ways that our old ways of explaining things have worked. Right? But here we between this bridge here, we, we want to explain the problem and we guess about the possible explanations. We've got thought experiments that structure and help us produce the future. Right? And here we go. We got the foresight tools that afford acceleration, modification, specification, alteration, and rearrangement of what is it that we know everything that we're carrying with us, right? Uh, to be able to create the variation that we need. Think of biology. So biology in evolution, it's a bit more blind, right? They, it does trial and error, and it's selected by the environment. Now we can, Popper says, we can let our theories die in our place, right? That we can actually hypo hypothesize about what might be, only to be able to reject the bad ones, but we don't die along with that rejection, right? So, and I, here we go. So foresight tools, here's a, a, a a subset of them, uh, and I believe that this is what we've got here between this problem orientation followed by how is it that we come up with the guesses, 
of a possible explanation, right? So from there, we can ask, uh, come up with options, we can draw implications, how might this happen, right? How might this impact us, right? We can, uh, again, develop options, what can we do about it? We can simulate as well, we can say how the options might perform under different conditions. So we're conjecturing not only a solution to the problem, but the context, if we do scenarios, for example, the context under which those options would work. So there's two sides to the conjecture, right? The, the, the solution side and the conditions under which the solutions would be a viable one, right? So um, it, that then takes us to a theory of strategic foresight, at least a strategic theory of applied strategic foresight, which would say, look, we've got distributed personalized knowledge in everybody's heads. We've built the futures in the present, Right? And we use those to do collective conjecture generation assessment and refinement. That's what I think would sound like from, from, from Popper's point of view. So then you could say, well, if you go back and think about this type of problem orientation, right? If you have a problem oriented toolkit, right? How is it that you can then pull the right tool out of the kit? And I would conjecture that we can actually create uncertainty landscapes, right? Which can then identify different levels of uncertainty and different of our ability to control the outcomes. So for example, my, my rabbit example, it's not very complex, right? And I got a lot of control over the situation. So I could do something like a pre-mortem, right? So imagine if I, okay, so the pre-mortem says, imagine that you go out one day and your rabbit's just like, it's cool, like it's a massacre rabbit everywhere, what kills it, right? And you can try to find those, you know, critical failures points, right? And maybe you come up with a box, right? The idea here is that the problem has a context of uncertainty around it that we don't know. That's what we're trying to generate the knowledge around is about the uncertainty that the problem is embedded in, right? Or inherent inside of the, the problem itself. And that's why it might help to then at least shortlist the tools if you did it like that. So you could, you, could, you could ask them, how complex is your environment? Do you have any control over it? And then you can give them a short list of, hey, these might be the tools that could be applicable for you, right? So we're not counting you know, every problem with a hammer, in, in, in a sense, yeah? So this has also implications for how we practice uh, strategic foresight, again, Popper says the growth of knowledge depends entirely upon disagreement, right? That if you have, you're, you might be right and I might be wrong, but if we sit together, we might get nearer to the truth, right? We have to disagree for that. So what does this mean? In practice, as facilitators at least, we need to foster the social preconditions for knowledge creation because for Popper then, it's ethical to pr protect the means of knowledge creation. You know, screw all you guys, right? But it's, it's the knowledge creation because the solutions to the problems can spread. So if you're able to solve problems, at least in Popper's world, right, those solutions could then spread globally, right? So um, five <coughs> preconditions for knowledge creation, for example, uh, announcing rules to protect the generation of conjecture. One minute. Um, facilitate the generation of conjectures, right? And this can be updated even by thinking about you know the way that conjecture is produced, we've got other old um, insights from the earliest days of brainstorming, for example, where we know that the more ideas that you start with, the closer you get to a problem, right? So there's a quantity game in, in the generation of conjectures, <coughs> right? But then we don't select, okay, it's not a bear. Refine the conjectures for evaluation, right? So how is it that we prepare Right, what we've got to try to put it to a test, right, to falsify it, for example. So here's, you bolster the best, most useful and insightful ideas, right? So you, we prioritize them, right? We formulate strong, compelling alternative explanations. We identify data findings and tests that can corroborate or refute idea, ideas. Yeah? And then we can test these conjectures and work towards plausible solutions, Right, so it's not enough for Popper to stop with the foresight, but he's gonna say, look, if you think you've got a solution, it becomes your ethical responsibility in a way to start testing that or making sure that those tests start happening. Because if you think you're onto something, and you might get a breakthrough, right? And that breakthrough could spread through the, the, you know, across the globe, then that's kind of on us, 
to, to see those through. So rapid prototyping corroborates uh, refuting uh, error correcting and thinking, right? And sometimes it's just enough for power to say, look, maybe we didn't get it this time, but we reformulated the way that we understand the problem itself. And for Popper, that's enough, yeah. right? To reformulate the problem, I have a better understanding of, of, of the problem. So that's my talk. Thanks for listening. Thank you.